Namaste and welcome to Indian Diplomacy, show about uh, India's foreign relations, India's uh, involvement in solving global problems and uh, India's ethos and value system and how they are making the world a better place. Viewers, uh, in this episode, we are uh, looking at the whole phenomenon of uh, global climate change, the climate crisis that is upon us and how India is emerging as a, a provider of uh, potential solutions to this uh, big crisis that's uh, enveloped the whole planet. And uh, to discuss how India is a thought leader and uh, also providing ideas for climate action uh, to resolve this uh, impending, the doomsday, that scenario that's uh, in front of us, I have with us uh, in the studio, very special guest, uh, Dr. Vibha Dhawan. Dr. Vibha Dhawan, is the director general of a very important uh, think tank and research institution of India. This is called the Energy and Resources Institute, Terry. And uh, she's a plant scientist, has a vast experience of dealing with uh, climate and energy and these kind of issues, both at the national and the international level. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you for joining us in this show. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Dhawan, when we talk about India's contribution to the crisis that is upon us and how we are trying to uh, push forward uh, solutions. Uh, first question that comes to mind is why is India doing this and why is India not just uh, domestically uh, looking at uh, transforming its energy and its uh, entire uh, approach to nature, but why is it also doing it for the world? And uh, you have been involved in international uh, conferences as well. And how, why is it that the world is looking up to India? Uh, in particular, uh, please tell our audiences. See, you are absolutely right in saying that India, I should say culturally also, we believe in sustainable development. So what has happened to the world today, it is not because of India or many of the developing economies. It's largely that the Western countries, they misuse the resources that were given to us on this planet. Mm -hmm. and. If we look at, because even today when we look at the impact of industrialization, India's contribution to that is very little. We are still in the phase of development. Now it provides us with opportunities, it provides us with challenges. Because what has happened to the world, the impact of climate change, unfortunately it is not uniform. Mm. It is countries like us which are going to suffer the most. And that heat waves, if the temperature goes up for some countries, it's going to be beneficial, but it's India where everything is going in the negative direction. The impact of climate change on glaciers, what is happening due to the cloud burst and the poor com communities, for them the impact of climate change, they suffer the most. Mm. And therefore, it is that that comes to us as a challenge. Now, there are two things which are really good. One is that we believe in sustainability. If mm. we look back 20, 30 years back, everything practically was recycled without talking about circular economy. We were still practicing it. The other is that our infrastructure is yet to be built. And therefore, it's not that we have to start with something, break and then rebuild. Mm. For us, it is still the build, building exercise. And because of our consciousness and the fact that we still have to develop our infrastructure, about two thirds is yet to be built. Mm. And therefore, when there is willpower, and of course, our honorable prime minister has made number of commitments. And for that, it shows that the government is very serious, that yeah. they want to take it up. And that seriousness also is his faith in general public, the, all the stakeholders of the country. Mm. that they will take that challenge and they will come up to his expectations. Talking of the Prime Minister, he was uh, in 2010, way back when he was Chief Minister of Gujarat, he authored a book called Convenient Action. Yeah. And this was a time, uh, Dr. Dhawan, you'll remember the reference point in the climate uh, conversation and discourse at the time was the inconvenient truth inconvenient of truth. Al Gore, the yeah. former US Vice President. And uh, Prime Minister Modi, who at that time was Chief Minister, was saying that we have to go beyond discourse and dialogue and we have to actually get down to action. Absolutely. And 
uh, I think the same vision has continues to this day now as Prime Minister where we are emphasizing more on the climate action rather than just the talk because a lot of environmentalists, you know them very well, are quite disappointed with the, you know, intergovernmental processes and all the multilateral dialogues and forums. There are so many negotiations. There's one coming up in Egypt, the next uh, COP27. Oh, yeah. uh, but then uh, the situation, as you mentioned, is quite dire and the crisis is getting bigger and bigger, the planetary warming and all these problems. So, uh, Prime Minister Modi's emphasis on action, I think, carries much greater uh, value and relevance than simply, you know, signing on to a text or committing to some targets and such things, which are fine, which are needed, uh, a kind of a superstructure. But really, what is happening on the ground is what he's emphasizing more. And that's where I think India brings in a certain sharpness of uh, thinking and uh, new ideas. Yeah, uh, there are two, three things which I would like to bring to the notice of all the audience. If we go back, say 20 years back, we really had to convince everyone that climate change is a threat. Today, whatever is happening, and maybe some of the things are not due to climate change, we still try to assign everything due to the climate, changing climate. Mm. So this awareness, which perhaps is also that we are talking about it, but it is also that it is happening. Just, and we can look into history ourselves. We, cloudburst few years back was something which was once in the lifetime kind of an incidence. But today it is happening perhaps every month, yeah. every season, which we can't afford. The other is that it is that all of us, like if you look at the slogans which have been given life, now it is that you have to think, it is not just the government's responsibility, it is responsibility of every citizen. Yes. We have to move away and it was long back, it was said by Mahatma Gandhi. He also uh, mentioned that India cannot afford the lifestyle of the West and mm. he said that then you need the entire planet. Absolutely. So therefore we were conscious. and. We can show the way to the world. On this matter, Prime Minister Modi has uh, launched a, a global campaign called Mission Life, L-I-F-E, Lifestyle for the Environment, and which is being widely appreciated uh, by governments as well as uh, people around the world. And this is meant to create a kind of a mass movement to uh, adopt uh, energy saving and uh, other practical measures to uh, save the planet from uh, further deterioration and destruction. I want you uh, viewers to listen into what uh, different world leaders have to say about mission life and then we'll continue this discussion. No one can address global challenges and especially climate change on its own. The Life Initiative is part of this agenda for stronger cooperation. I wanted to say a few words to wish you a great success in its implementation. France looks forward to working with India to make this initiative a success, including in the perspective of the Indian presidency of the G20 next year. Thank you for this initiative and thank you for your attention and your commitment. We are grateful to Prime Minister Modi for his leadership together with the UN Secretary General in launching Mission Life. The power of change lies in working together towards a common goal and engaging all the people and communities on the planet. Georgia welcomes and fully supports this global initiative timely introduced by His Excellency Narendra Modi, which promotes an environmentally conscious lifestyle that focuses on the principle of mindful and deliberate utilization. C'est en changeant les pratiques et les mentalités que nous pouvons changer les choses. Je suis convaincu que life pourrait devenir l'un des points tournants dans notre lutte contre la crise climatique. Je remercie l'Inde à travers son Premier ministre qui est un leader inspirant en matière de protection de l'environnement de nous avoir rassemblés autour de cette cause. So viewers, uh, you just got a snapshot of how the international community is responding to Mission Life, uh, India's new uh, movement to bring about uh, greater consciousness around uh, energy saving and around uh, greener uh, lifestyles. Uh, Dr. Dhawan, um, Prime Minister has said that we need to move from 
mindless and destructive consumption to mindful utilization of resources. Uh, and this, I think, comes to the heart of the question, right? I mean, we have over 7 billion people on the planet. And instead of looking at the problem as just 193 countries or just a lot of industries and corporate houses, he is bringing it down to, you know, every individual on this planet and all of whom are the real stakeholders in this ongoing crisis with the climate. So, uh, the reception you just saw, you know, from around the world, it shows that people are actually uh, seeing value in these kind of initiatives, right? And uh, the more, I think, average uh, planetary citizens are uh, conscious, we'll be able to really bring about micro level you know, changes Absolutely. that will all add up to something big, <laughs> right? That is Prime Minister's vision because he, as a democratic leader, he believes in mass movements, you know, and mobilizing the public. And I don't think anyone else could have come up with something like this idea around the world. But the fact that uh, so many countries are signing on and are joining this initiative is quite hopeful. And um, so your thoughts on the mission life and what all it can do. I mean, we have also announced some 75 eco-friendly actions that every individual you and I and all of us who are watching can do, you know. So those kind of things, if we are at least uh, cognizant of them and it's in the back of our mind, whenever we do something, I think uh, bit by bit, it may, you know, drip by drip, it may become an ocean that may help uh, resolve this crisis. Absolutely. You are absolutely uh, right in saying that every drop counts. And it same is true, like all our actions, and why should we say it is the government is not doing not doing anything or internationally we are really not conscious it's mode of lip service because ultimately it is me who also have to be who will suffer and whose action will also contribute to the climate change and therefore to involve all all the citizens every stakeholders into this entire movement is the only way to move forward the other thing is that we, when we are buying things, because happily as the economic growth happens, perhaps the very first thing people invest in is in mobility. They mm. want to have bigger and bigger cars. Is it really required? You look at the wardrobes full of clothes. Do we really require them? Because we are not conscious what it means to GHG emission if I'm buying more clothes. Yeah. What happens if I'm taking holiday miles and miles away from my country. So therefore, we should be conscious of that, how we are adding to the climate change. Yeah, that's and what that is what, and it is not that going in sustainable way is going to be expensive or it's going to cause any discomfort. The answer is no, it's only mindset. It's a mindset change and that's what Prime Minister Modi has been um, calling for, exactly. not just within India, but on the global on stage. The global and Dr. Dhawan, uh, apart from the uh, life, mission life, um, there are also, you know, we have India's made major commitments for uh, shifting towards renewables Absolutely. as per the Paris Climate Accord. And we have been actually a very uh, dutiful uh, global citizen on this count. We have uh, met our targets. The last I have is 165 gigawatts of uh, installed renewable capacities, uh, what we have at, the, at present. It was uh, less than half of it around 2014. Yeah. So we have doubled our capacity. We have a goal uh, of 50% of total energy mix coming from renewables by 2030. Some people think that it's ambitious, but the space at which we have doubled it, uh, I think we can be quietly confident in the next eight years we can achieve that. So when we talk about climate action, there are you know a lot of countries like you mentioned, which uh, form the industrialized countries, which actually formerly had polluted the planet, but they talk big, but then uh, the credibility is low because historical emissions are so high for them. On the other hand, it, there is a country like India that is walking the talk, uh, living up to commitments, even doing ahead of time on our international commitments. And that makes, I think, India's voice in this field much more credible. Uh, yeah, you're absolutely right. And one of the other things is that Really speaking, we have very few options. We don't have fossil fuel with us. And so God has given us a lot of, I should say, sun's energy. Mm. So why not to move to renewables? And even today, if we look at the total generation through solar, through wind, 
we are much ahead of many other countries. Yeah. And that is because the uh, region falls in where there is a lot of sunlight. Mm. And right now, we are importing most of the fuel from overseas, which yeah. is burden on our foreign exchange. So, going for renewables is win-win for India. It is that first we are blessed with sun's energy all through the year practically. There are areas where you have lot of wind, where there is hydro potential. So, why not to encash that? Absolutely. And then they are also clean energy sources. So, if you have to invest, why to have a natural pipe uh, gas pipeline than to invest in renewables? So, that is what we are doing and we are ahead of our targets. And, and Dr. Dhawan, you have also been involved in the biofuels uh, development. Absolutely. And uh, nuclear, biofuel and hydro, people generally do not think about these, mostly solar and wind when they talk of uh, renewables. So, how are those sectors coming? See, biofuel, again, it has enormous potential and I must compliment government because they have set up center of excellence for bioenergy, biofuels and so on. So, you are actually killing two birds with one stone mm. because on one hand, you are taking care and I won't like, I dislike to use the word waste, it is wasted material. So, all your agriculture residue and many other ways they can be used for generating energy and we have plenty of it. And again, I will again come back to that because we are blessed with sun's energy, mm. our potential to grow biomass is far greater than many other countries. And, and there is a lot of emphasis how to integrate research. So, like when I am talking of center of excellence on bioenergy, mm. then there were five different centers supported by government through department of biotechnology to work on various technologies. So, enzyme production, looking into the, how do you make, including alga. So, we are looking into all those options. So, we can become the hub in bio, biofuel and uh, really speaking, the blending in petrol, uh, diesel. We are ahead of what our target date was. We are almost six months ahead of 20 percent blending. Absolutely. So, success is quite a bit. And so, India can become a hub in a number of renewable energy sectors and of course, uh, our values, our ethos have always been to share our technological uh, know-how and prowess uh, with uh, fellow developing countries. So, as India becomes a, a leader on the climate uh, uh, issue, it will also benefit uh, fellow developing countries. One such initiative viewers is the International Solar Alliance. Uh, this was created a few years ago uh, through the vision of Prime Minister Narendra Modi and now you know it has almost universal subscription and around the world uh, countries have joined the ISA. I want you to hear uh, about the progress that the ISA has been making uh, and continue the discussion. On November 30th, 2015, more than 40 countries lying in the sunbelts between the two tropics came together and formed the International Solar Alliance a treaty-based intergovernmental body. The founding conference of ISA held in March 2018, a few months after the framework agreement came into force, was graced by President Emmanuel Macron of France and Prime Minister Narendra Modi of India. ISA works with governments to approve energy access and energy security around the world and promote solar power as a sustainable way to transition to a carbon-neutral future. ISA's mission is to unlock 1 trillion US dollars of investment in solar and deploy 1,000 gigawatts of solar power by 2030, while reducing the cost of the technology and finance. The ISA has identified and designed new solar projects, supported governments to make their energy policies solar friendly and attractive to investments, pools demand for world-class solar technology and improved access to finance by working with France and the World Bank, and increased access to solar training, data and insights for solar engineers. ISA looks forward to collaborating with other nations to realize the dream of a global solar grid. One sun, one world, one grid. A visionary idea of the Prime Minister of India. Even while pledging to develop concrete actions towards mitigating climate change by 2030. Let us together build a brighter future. It was uh, the revolutionary idea of One Sun, One World, One Grid, uh, OSOWOG. This has really been a transformative one and this underpins the International Solar Alliance. And uh, I can tell you now the advanced studies are on 
to connect the electric grids of uh, South Asia, Southeast Asia and West Asia and ultimately to link it up to Africa. So uh, imagine a situation where you know the whole world is under one electric grid. This is the vision and all of this uh, powered by renewables uh, including solar energy. Uh, Dr. Dhawan, revolutionary idea, I mean just think about the transformative impact this will have. I mean right now it may still seem like a futuristic idea that the whole world will be under one grid. but if we don't think big and if we don't start acting yeah. towards it, we'll never achieve that goal, right? We'll just be dreamers. So I think that uh, first step we have already made through the Solar Alliance. And uh, already you hear a lot of projects have been commissioned, uh, small impact ones uh, around um, in the global south, in South America, in Africa, and Asia under the ISA umbrella. So this is actually our signature uh, contribution to the international, the global crisis that is, uh, that is ongoing. Uh, really speaking, if you look at, because you are absolutely like, right, you have to dream big and something which is achievable and the reason behind it. You, if uh, the storage cost, because see, you want electricity 24 hours. It cannot be 12 hours or 8 hours kind of uh, is makeshift arrangement. During those 8 to 12 hours, you are making more energy than what you can use. And the moment you invest in storage, then it is that you are still polluting because you are using batteries for storing that electricity. Mm. On the other hand, if it is transmitted, because there will be sun shine somewhere or the other in the world. So you are using that energy to light or for your energy requirements during night time. And similarly, during daytime when it is dark somewhere else, you are providing that electricity. So therefore, you will never be surplus. It will be energy security practically at the global level, almost same prices. So you are bringing even production at the uh, same level of mm. cost. And that is where it is that this is something which is required by the world. This is required by the world. And uh, viewers, I wanted to tell you that apart from the Solar Alliance, India has also launched a number of other uh, initiatives for global good in the energy and climate uh, fields. One is the Coalition for Disaster Resilient Infrastructure, CDRI. There's also infrastructure for resilient island states, for small island states that are at highest risk of rising sea levels due to global warming and all that. India has also joined High Ambition Coalition for Nature and People. This is an important uh, grouping. We are also part of a Climate and Clean Air Coalition. I can list out many, many other such initiatives uh, which are of the international level where India is a active participant and is trying to shape the initiative. And uh, uh, talking of that, uh, uh, our, our contribution to the global you know, movement, fo forward movement on this issue, uh, Dr. Dhawan, the COP27 is coming up. And uh, again, India will raise the key issues that matter to us and to the global south, climate justice, climate equity, and uh, climate finance. And uh, this is an area which is uh, not been given due attention uh, in because the focus has mostly been on the carbon emissions and cutting carbon emissions. But the parallel to that is adoption of green technologies. So India as a voice of the global south, as a voice, as a representative, you know, leader of all the developing countries, uh, uh, what will be our position in Egypt, in Sharm el-Sheikh, and uh, how does it reflect all that we have talked about? which is that we are making fast progress. We want the rest of the global south to also do it. And the international community as a whole must be galvanized to make this uh, transition to green. Yeah, see COP meetings, of course, we are talking from Paris and it's every year we have this uh, meeting. And there are a lot of negotiations as well. And of course, some of them are, I should say, quite realistic. Some of them are looking into the entire planet as one and where the benefits should go. But then we are really not taking actions. You talk of climate mm. finance. We are talking of that we require much more. But then whatever has been committed, has it really been invested? The mm. answer to that is no. We are talking of green technologies. But then green technologies, again, somewhere we are looking into our own benefits. What kind of IPR, what kind of money can I make out of it? As a business opportunity. As a business opportunity, we are really not looking into and still not realizing that we have only one planet to live in. Mm -hmm. And therefore, it should be more of that other countries, they should also have access to the technology. 
And I repeatedly say that share the technology, like first of all, no technology can be plug and play. You have to work that technology, fine tune that technology to the way you want to use it. Mm. The other good point about Indians is they are very innovative. And therefore, the technology which is far more expensive and maybe not affordable, the moment you have a group of, I should say, because there is a need, there is a fire, they want to use that technology for their benefit. So they will ensure that it becomes affordable. Mm. So one is not saying it's only the finance. Yes, and no one is asking for subsidies. We are perhaps only asking for a sort of that one is able to afford the technology to begin with. Mm. And thereafter, it will be rotate on its own. It is proof of concept. Mm. So it is not subsidies one is asking for. One is asking for technology sharing so that that can perhaps be refined to the level that the entire global community will be benefited by that. Absolutely. And the innovation, the frugal innovation that you talked about is really India's strength. Um, our climate scientists are working very hard uh, to generate new ideas and new uh, devices and equipment that can be quickly adapted to other uh, developing countries in particular. So there's a lot going on as uh, we talk about the uh, global uh, climate change, uh, the existential threat of uh, two degrees warming uh, since 1800, uh, the, since the dawn of the Industrial Revolution. The idea that you know we will not uh, be able to even bequeath uh, this planet to our future generations, it's a really a daunting challenge. But India has risen to the task and uh, as we've discussed today, uh, India uh, is contributing to uh, the global public goods, clean air, clean water, and uh, reasonable protection from rising sea levels, all these you know, existential issues, uh, we seem to be uh, at the forefront. And the reason for that is the leadership, but also our society, our values, as well as uh, our technological prowess. Dr. Vibha Dhawan, thank you so much for enlightening the audience thank today you. on these issues. Viewers, think about uh, the climate change crisis. I, probably it is the biggest global uh, problem uh, and then underneath that you will see many other issues and uh, certainly when there is a when the going gets tough the tough gets going as the cliche goes and India is on the move uh, on climate action and there's a lot more uh, promise and potential for India to deliver we have problems on the climate front but we are at the same time coming forward uh, to cooperate with other countries and deliver solutions uh, until next time take care I'll see you soon